I'm a soldier at war I know you've seen my face before I am red, white and blue I am black and brown and yellow too I have killed and I have died All alone and damaged deep inside And the child Sacrifice for some insanity Left the boy Now half a man My innocence was lost In a foreign land Fought so hard And I fought so long I fought for my country Right or wrong In the eye Spangled banner did I see There is blood on the water It's flowing like the blood inside of me In smoke-filled rooms The men of might Will send your son somewhere to fight And I am one of many more Just pawn This is uh, Dan Shea with Veterans for Peace Forum. Uh, today is, of course, uh, Memorial Weekend, and there are a number of events that are going to be taking place. Uh, Veterans for Peace, uh, Chapter 72, actually has an event coming up here uh, for Memorial Day called From War to Peace. It's going to be Monday, of course, May 30th, a gathering at 1130, uh, 11.30 a.m., and the ceremony is going to be at 12 noon. It's going to be at the Memorial Coliseum's Korean, wall vet, uh, <coughs> war, Korean War Wall, and that's at uh, 14, 1401 North Wheeler Avenue. Now, part of this is going to be, uh, this is Veterans for Peace, is, will be commemorating the Memorial Day um, at the Forgotten. For many people, uh, 
that have served in the, these wars from uh, World War I, Korea, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the current wars. Too often our, the names of our uh, veterans are, uh, are, car are left uh, remembered, the forgotten are remembered in granite, uh, cold stone, and forgotten memories for a lot of people. And only the f if you've seen in some of the pictures of uh, Mike Hasties and the, the roll-in, uh, it's, it's the families that go to those names and remember those people and put their fingers right on those names that give life and soul back to those people that are lost. But for me, it's often, this is not just about remembering people, but remembering how we failed at creating peace. Because we don't want to see any more names and any more monuments. Uh, we would like to see that we live in a world of peace and we bring the troops home. Uh, that's an important part. Oftentimes when I'm doing this program, I also want to recommend a book. I'm always reading and trying to keep up and understand how we end up in these wars. There's a great book uh, called end, <clears throat> To End All Wars by, by Adam Hochschild. That's H-O-C-H-S-C-H-I-L-D. I read one of his first books, which was uh, King Leopold's Ghost, which is a history of the Belgium king going into the Congo. and. Uh, in the name of liberating the people from slavery, uh, often like the liberation of people in Iraq and Afghanistan, now Libya, um, he went in and actually occupied the country and brutally enslaved people for the rubber trees and minerals that were available there. So it's a horrible story, history, but it's also about uh, uh, a number of people who were in missions who reported that story and what was going on and raised in London and around the world some of the few first human rights organizations. Uh, this book um, deals with sort of a history from the British side of the, uh, of the story and how the First World War got started. Of course, this was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand uh, on his visit to Sarajevo. Now, Britain was looking for an excuse you know, and this assassination was one of those excuses to go in, and they knew that it would spark Germany to go in and, and uh, 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 go through uh, Belgium. And they began an attack. Uh, uh, all these countries were looking for um, uh, an excuse to go in, almost like the Gulf of Tonkin. It was something that they were looking forward to. And hundreds of thousands of British young men and women began being recruited into the war. Uh, but it's also a story about the anti-war movement. It's about the suffrage movement. It's about women who were fighting in their own country and were looking at the uh, uh, as war as a terrible enemy in itself uh, because it was taking away people's uh, uh, rights towards social programs that were being built, labor unions. The government itself thought that uh, uh, there might be a civil war within the country and that war would be a good opportunity to rally people around under nationalism and break all of those unions and put people to work. In fact, the economy, they said, was a bumpy economy, and often not like our own. And young men and women, were to, uh, the government would tell the charities not to uh, furnish supplies or charity to young men that were eligible for uh, the war and were thus then encouraged to join the military. Uh, this is just a part of the history, and I'm only a little bit into the book, but uh, Adam writes books in history, factual history that he's researched, but at the same time he writes it like a novel. It's almost like reading uh, John Steinbeck. Uh, incredible book. If you get an opportunity, you should pick that book up, read it. Um, today's guest is uh, Rick uh, Stagenborg. He's an MD and uh, uh, was, was formerly a, a VA psychiatrist. Uh, also made a run for the U.S. Senate in 2010 and uh, is the founder of uh, Soldiers for Peace International. And today's topic is the eradication of war by restoring democracy in America. Rick, uh, thank you for coming to the program today. Um, you were going to say something about Memorial Day. Give a little history on that. Um, well, I basically just, uh, I use Facebook a lot for communication with other members of Soldiers for Peace International. And today I 
created an event and send it to uh, all the members of, on Facebook, re asking them to create events themselves and remind people that Memorial Day is about the fallen, but that uh, war affects all of us. That's right. And um, it's not a day of celebration uh, unless you want to celebrate the lives of these people. Um, I wrote a a book called uh, Stop the Madness, A Diary of a Soldier for Peace in the War to Take Back America that's linked to the website. And um, a lot of the essays have to do with uh, war. One of the one I wrote for Memorial Day last year was um, uh, Remembering the Fallen. And so I, I put that on the um, event and ask people to share it. It's my thoughts about it. Well, my um, remembering the fallen, my brother, Michael, went into, <clears throat> came into uh, Vietnam at the same time I was there, uh, was brought home in a straitjacket after uh, a terrible uh, firefight that took place. And uh, he was one of some 17 left alive in the platoon. Um, <clears throat> Michael passed away just last year, July 7th, I believe it was, and uh, and this weekend we'll be going down to uh, the coast uh, to to spread his ashes, uh, part of his ashes. The other part of his ashes are up at the Willamette uh, Veterans Memorial Cemetery. And uh, this is also a day in which I remember my son Casey, who war oftentimes, like you said, affects all families. Uh, when I came back, of course, being an Agent Orange victim, my son was born with congenital heart disease and other abnormalities. And at the age of three, went for surgery and uh, surgery that went bad, and he went into a coma. And seven weeks later, died in my arms. He is also buried up at Willamette Univers uh, uh, Cemetery. Uh, and so this is a day. My wife will be up there, and uh, I have a difficult time going up there. Um, but I'll be at the Peace Park. Uh, I will be at the uh, VFP Memorial, uh, Korean Memorial Wall at the Coliseum, and then from there we will, uh, after some commencements, we will mar march over to the Peace Park. Uh, another memory, and that this is not just about the fallen, but this is about we war no more, and that the greatest tribute we can do for all of these veterans uh, who, like most of us who went into the military, <coughs> wasn't uh, because we glorified war, but because we thought we were trying to bring peace uh, or liberate or whatever lie we were told <laughs> at the time. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we know now is that most of these things, as we look back in history, is that uh, people went to war for the ruling elites. They went to war for uh, land, power, hegemony, and for m material resources from one country to the next. And so when you're talking about here the eradication of war by restoring democracy, what do you mean? What is your mission here? Well, I quit my job working for the VA, gave up my life insurance, uh, spent a lot of my retirement money, um, gave up my health insurance because um, I have kids and uh, I didn't want to see them growing up in a fascist society or a fascist new world order. Um, corporations have so much power because of uh, the Supreme Court has granted them human rights that they can now outright buy uh, the loyalty of the majority of members of Congress. And that's why I quit, so that I could run for the U.S. Senate and promote the idea that we can change this by introducing a constitutional amendment into both houses of Congress and um, running candidates to support it in forcing the corporate tools in Congress to make a choice. Are they going to work for the people or the corporations? That was the whole point of my campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was pretty successful considering the corporate media ignored me as a third party candidate. The people that I was able to reach listened. And um, I think that other people are, are following that example. There were actually ten people in the country that I knew of running for the Senate um, who had pledged to amend. But I don't think any of them focused on that issue. Uh, what people don't understand is this isn't just another issue. This is the issue that we have to face if we're going to address all the other issues. Because we have to do it through the political process. A grassroots movement is excellent. It's necessary to awaken the people 
but then they have to use it in, in, to change the way the political system works. Strip the corporations of their power, replace their puppets in Congress with people who will work for us, and then there's no way that we're going to have wars. Every single war since, since World War II was uh, for, the, for corporate profit. And if we, if we make it impossible for them to manipulate Congress because they won't be able to give them any money, then we won't have war. Well, not only uh, uh, about war, but also about the idea that, I mean, they, they are giving money to various parties, mm -hmm. both parties, right. uh, major parties, and this sort of uh, rights of personhood was for the very fact that it legalized their right to give money right. undisclosed, That's the most important, undisclosed yeah. almost. Is that correct? That's the most important consequence of Citizens United. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, they did say that uh, that they had the right to give the money anonymously. And these they didn't say that that only applied to um, country, uh, companies wholly owned in the United States. So what that means is international corporations can now buy our, they can get in on the bidding war for our, the loyalty of our uh, Congress. So that's a very dangerous development. And if it was happening before, it was illegal. But now the Supreme Court says there's, there's no limits. There's still limits on direct contributions to candidates. But that's not, a, that's not a barrier at all, because you have things like crossroads, car roads, crossroads, um, and other uh, mechanisms to funnel money to um, fascists, basically, who um, will uh, support the wars, they'll support um, union busting, they'll support uh, destruction in the environment for profit, denial of health care for profit, um, and basically a system of corporate welfare that's bankrupting the country. So the, people wonder, I was wondering myself not that long ago, just a couple of years ago, why is it that Congress doesn't work? And I started reading about corporate personhood and I realized, well, that, there it is in a nutshell. So why aren't we doing anything about it? If getting health care, if any war, if saving the environment, uh, all these things, converting to a green economy, establishing any kind of economy that works, if all those things depend on getting rid of the corporate tools in the Senate, uh, particularly, but Congress in general, we absolutely need to devote our resources, our time, our efforts to fighting that specifically. And that's why I've started a um, work group for uh, Veterans for Peace um, on the issue of abolition of corporate personhood. I'm hoping to get a really good uh, response. It's certainly an idea whose time has come, and I think a lot of people realize it. Yeah, and when he's talking about these working groups is that Veterans for Peace in trying to build greater democracy within its own organization is to spread out uh, uh, various issues that are available to local chapters to come together and they can actually communicate across states mm -hmm. through the internet which has given us that opportunity uh, to work on issues like corporate personhood or post-traumatic stress or Agent Orange. I'm on an Agent Orange uh, working group. Uh, these are issues in which if you're a veteran and you want to be involved in these issues, you know, become a member of Veterans for Peace. Go to uh, uh, Veterans for Peace, spell the whole word out, dot org, and you'll get on to the national. Our local chapter here is Veterans for Peace, chapter 72, dot org. It's just VFP, 72, dot org. Those are two organizations, I mean, there are ways that you can contact us, get more information. We're also going to have a convention coming up, and that's going to be August uh, third to the seventh at Portland State University, uh, and we have a number of workshops. I think we're almost around 30 to 40 workshops uh, uh, on various issues and a number of speakers. We're going to have Kathy Kelly of uh, Voices in the Wilderness as a keynote speaker. Uh, you want to find out more of that, again, go to our websites and you can find out more about that. Uh, one of the things when I'm thinking about corporate personhood is, I always thought it was there. I mean, I w I've been arguing against uh, corporate personhood for many, many years, uh, and yet it was only within the uh, last few years. When was the, uh, the decision of uh, Citizens United? Actually, it has been present for many, many years. The, the significance of Citizens United is that it very publicly blew the lid on it and, and removed all limits. So when they went out and did polls, 80% of self-identified conservatives and liberals were opposed to the decision, which means that 20% don't understand it. <laughs> because 
only a fascist would be in favor of the decision, and there simply aren't 20% of, of Americans who are fascists, right. at least not consciously. So, um, yeah, it is relatively new, but the Citizens United decision was in, uh, I believe it was October of 2009. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that really awakened people to, you know, what the problem is. But as usual, the lamestream media ignored it, and the so-called alternative media um, ignored its significance. It's just another issue. Um, gee, oh, ba too bad we can't do anything about it. We have to. We have to work with the Democrats. Oh, come on, give me a break. They're they're uh, as a whole. Again, it's not all of them, but as a whole, the party is too heavily influenced by corporate money, just like the Republican Party. Right. They may say the right things, but. It's like the situation in Nazi Germany where he had the fascists and the fascist collaborators and there was nothing in between. There was no, the people that were really working to um, end fascism in Germany and Europe uh, were the workers, the labor unions. But they just labeled them all communists and then started rounding them up and people let them. And this is also analogous to what's happening now. Labor unions have been attacked for decades. Um, and uh, we have to support the unions, but the unions have to support us too. This is all one effort. And so uh, we need healthcare advocates, we need anti-war activists, we need environmental activists to see that this is the central issue we all need to work on. And when they do, then maybe people like Tom Hartman and Jim Hightower and Ed Schultz and even David Swanson, I'm afraid to say, will wake up to the fact that if they don't just stop talking about the problem and start talking about the solution that um, it's going to be a, wrong, a long hard road but we can do it if they do start talking about it. Well too it would seem that uh, when you're talking about some of these uh, things is that we have the parties of Tweedledee and Tweedledum. You know? Tweedledee and or Tweedledum and Tweedledumer <laughs> I call them. And, uh, <laughs> And I mean, I mean, there's some good people within the, those parties. I mean, I, I, I think Barbara Lee has done some terrific things. Uh, uh, Kucinich has done a number of great things. And, is, and Bernie Sanders, who's mm -hmm. a socialist par party member, uh, have spoken out boldly. Um, but in, in the, like you said, money is what seems to be ruling. It doesn't matter which party you are. It's mm -hmm. the, the key kingpin of this, uh, how legislation is being run. And the lobbyists are the ones that are really running this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also, when you talk about this sort of corporate power having its influence internationally, internationally uh, we're looking at the World Trade Organizations, mm -hmm. and the World Trade Organizations actually are uh, uh, supra uh, 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 sovereignty. Non-governmental, non right. Non-governmental. I mean, they have, they are creating laws in which presidents and uh, local citizens of nations have no say in. They cannot do anything about it. these rules. Somehow the the presidents or the uh, uh, various nations have agreed to put them in charge. Mm -hmm. Well, well, who's running the world? You know, I mean, this is. Uh, I call them the international corporate terrorists. That's who's running the world. So when we talk about fascists. Let's give a little bit of a definition of fascists. Well, I, I use the term in the sense that Mussolini defined it, which is it, it's a marriage between corporation and state. So that the corporations depend on the government to um, tilt the playing field in their favor and they have all the advantages and then they pay them back by paying a little pittance of their profit to keep them in office. So I've read the, an estimate that the return on that investment is about 100 to 1,000 to 1, depending on the industry. So it's pretty cheap to buy a senator these days, even though all that money adds up to quite a bit in our eyes. Mm -hmm. um, but they get it from the taxpayer because they twist the regulations and the rules so that they, they get massive profits and the, and, and the taxpayer and the consumer ends up paying for it. So you're looking at starting a third party or bringing uh, parties together to uh, implement? Because you're going to need a party to sit down and actually vote these things in to, and take over uh, in Congress to make these things go through. Is that correct? Well, actually, no. That was my first thought. Well, actually, it wasn't my first thought. It was my second thought. I wanted to run as a Democrat, but I didn't have time to prepare for a primary. Mm -hmm. It was too late by the time I made my decision. So I ran for a third party. Actually, I ran for two third parties, but neither one really was effective. They're, they they aren't.
they don't operate to elect candidates. They operate just to stay on the ballot so they can spread their message. Raise issues. Yeah. And in the case of the Oregon Progressive Party, uh, they told me directly that their the reason they formed the party was so that they could get Ralph Nader on the ballot, who also has no intention of winning. Um, so if I run again, it's going to be as a Democrat. And I, I wanted to mention, I'm glad you asked the question, because Dennis Kucinich, you know, I was in Seattle at the Green Festival. He was speaking there. And I had the opportunity to ask him one of the first questions. So I said, um, will you help us get together a group of senators and congressmen who will introduce constitutional amendment into, into the floor of Congress? And he said, yes. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. While I was there, I found out that Maria Cantwell, one of the co-founders of Move to Amend, is running for the Senate in Washington. Shortly thereafter, I found out that we have a young man in Portland running against David Wu. His name is uh, Calico Castile, and he has taken the pledge to amend. And my advice to them is to make that the centerpiece of their campaign. I'm sure Maria will do it because she's so big into the issue, and I think I convinced Calico to do it too. So there's three right there that are already on board. Mm -hmm. Merkley has said that he would support it, but he won't introduce it by himself, I'm sure. And that's why it's important to get a group of them to do it together so they won't be individually targeted as badly. And then our job is to build support for it so that people will not only recognize how important an issue it is, but because 80% of conservatives and liberals agree that it's a horrible thing and you know it's absolutely must be dealt with, mm -hmm. whoever, whoever supports it is going to get support from both sides. And so we just need to make people aware of it so they'll know they have that support and do it. Sanders, I'm sure, will do it. Ron Paul will probably do it. <coughs> if we can get McCain to do it, <laughs> that would really be a coup. Well, we've got him to sign on to some other progressive things before. Well, it's, uh, you know, I, I've, you and I have spoken before. I'm not one that really follow uh, uh, or believe or have much faith in the uh, electoral system. Uh, mainly because I've been betrayed over and over and over again. I always, uh, um, I usually support uh, alternative candidates. Uh, uh, last time, uh, of course, I did uh, Cynthia McKinney, mm -hmm. uh, who has been always in the forefront of on these issues and covers all of those topics. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm, I still believe if people would somehow begin to. Uh, vote their conscience rather than their party. That when the strong message is out there, especially now that we see what's happening in Wisconsin and Iowa mm -hmm. and, and the various rank and file members who mm -hmm. are actually coming out and really doing major strikes and taking over buildings and call, doing recalls right. uh, are really starting to make something happen. It's, it, it seemed as though it started with Tunisia and then That's Egypt. That's exactly right. And we are all Egyptians Wisconsin. now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, what was interesting, I remember in, um, uh, in Wisconsin, you know, they were showing these people around uh, when they took over the city hall there and uh, the state capitol there. And, and they, um, uh, there was food being sent from all these people around the United States, but there was some food that was there they were pointing out that was sent from Egypt. Yeah, from the work that's in right. Egypt. They paid for it from the local you know. pizza bar. <laughs> and there's there's also a lot of misunderstanding about that revolution too, and and that is that uh, somehow this was spontaneous. Uh, these were people who had been fighting and building their unions and uh, young people that were tired of uh, the same old politics mm -hmm. and speaking out. I remember in the uh, during the Vietnam War, student movements were some of the biggest movements, but there were key people that came out. Uh, mm -hmm. One of those was Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. who, you know, <laughs> uh, said no Vietnamese ever called him an, the N-word, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and refused to join the military and ended up losing his title. Uh, here's a man who stood up against the war and stood up for the rights of uh, civil rights movement and other people in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those, and he actually, that sort of celebrity brought people around to discuss these issues and brought more people into it. And of course, uh, the Vietnam veterans against the war mm -hmm. uh, came out. Another history which is not told, many people, too many people do not know that uh, Vietnam veterans against the war 
was uh, uh, formed by veterans that were already serving in Vietnam and those that had came out and were now veterans who were in the forefront. Uh, underground papers, uh, there were mutinies in the field. Uh, um, it was an amazing event and when you start to think about what is important to reach out. I mean, I like the idea of Veterans for Peace, of course. Uh, we taught, we have people from World War II to the present, you know. Uh, we had p people uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, there's also another organization called Iraqi Veterans Against the War. Uh, these young men and women now, because women are now in the combat zones, and uh, they always were, but uh, now they can actually be put in really fighting uh, areas, and uh, they're coming back with post-traumatic stress. You're a psychiatrist. Right. You were at the VA, mm -hmm. and you talk a little bit about you know the cost of war, the, what it's doing to our young men and women, and you said families. Right. Well, it's devastating. Um, Thirty percent of women are probably. It's estimated that thirty percent of women are raped in the military, um, whether they serve in war zones or not. I've worked with a number who were raped when they were in training. Military se Military sexual trauma, and I'm mostly rape. Yeah. I mean, not just yeah. fondling or leering. Um, that's a hundred percent incidence. Um, but uh, that's a big unaddressed problem. The VA mandates treatment be available, well, even if they got other than honorable discharges. But the VA frequently denies them care um, if they got a other than honorable. Um, there's a law that that bans VA benefits for uh, veterans who got other than honorable. Well, in my practice, right. I met a half a dozen vets in a small mm -hmm. clinic right. who had been denied VA benefits. Well, they were all combat veterans or rape victims. And that means, if you extrapolate, there's tens of thousands of veterans from Vietnam onward who never got services and they need it more than anybody. That's right. And it's because of a law passed in 1995, which was a Republican Congress but signed by a Democratic president. So it's a bipartisan assault on, on veterans, combat veterans. It's absolutely unconscionable. Um, I wrote a, a, an, a, a bill, a draft of a bill, and it's in Sanders' office, and I'm hoping that he's going to rewrite it and introduce it and get those benefits for those veterans, including also there's a lot of veterans, foreign nationals, who were deported. That's right. Because they got other than honorables because they had PTSD. Now I, I spoke to the um, director uh, of mental health services in central office, the former director, and he agreed with me. This was the problem. But I haven't been able to get Shinseki's office. I haven't been able to get past Shins the people around Shinseki to get the message to him that he could help us with this. Um, and the members of the uh, uh, Senate Veteran Affairs Committee that I was working with were not very receptive. Mm -hmm. Sanders' aide is the only one who really gave me the time of day. So that's what I'm trying to do about it. But as far as how it affects people uh, around the veterans, it affects family members because people with PTSD are neglectful, they're emotionally withdrawn, they're easily prone to anger, mm -hmm. they're very rigid and controlling because that's how they stayed alive in combat and they stay that way when they get out. So their children grow up in authoritarian households frequently, which breeds unfortunately neoconservatism. <laughs> <laughs> That's essentially what it is, is it's an authoritarian mindset. But it, it does more than that. I mean, it's emotionally damaging to children. Mm -hmm. It leads to um, child abuse, spouse abuse. Um, and we're seeing now a rash of um, murder-suicides. Uh, divorce rate is astronomical. Alcoholism and drug addiction is astronomical. They're setting records in all those categories in veteran suicide. Because this war has gone on and on, it's being fought by a small number of young men and women, and they're going back over and over. And we know from Vietnam that when people re-up, mm -hmm. it's usually because they're so screwed up already they can't imagine how to reintegrate into society. So imagine what it's like after six tours in a combat zone. That's right. And it's a lot like Vietnam in the fact that they don't know who the enemy is. They can be attacked at any, it's worse because the fobs are really fairly vulnerable. They get attacked all the time. I don't know. I don't know if it's worse. Well, wasn't there, you can't really compare. Wasn't there just a, uh, a court case uh, the judge had, had ordered? I just read it on Facebook. I was trying to look it up here. I can't find it. But uh, that ordered the um, uh, 
uh, that the VA had to uh, uh, move quicker in these cases. Mm -hmm. uh, they were saying, you know, it's taken up to four years to deal with some of these. Well, there's 18 suicides a day, mm -hmm. uh, and a majority of them are women, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, this is something that they've just been ordered. This is one of the first real victories that we've had in the courts. Now it probably may be appealed, but it's uh, an important decision, I think, at this time. Well, the VA is being pulled right and left. They prioritized Agent Orange. They prioritized people just getting out of the field. They can't keep it straight, and they still can't catch up. And every time they focus on one group, there are, there's bottlenecks for everybody else. So. Um, Having been an examiner for the VA and knowing how the system works, I'm telling you, I could streamline that damn thing by myself if I had the power. But Shinseki is not an administrator. Well, he is. A general is an administrator. But um, he's not used to the VA bureaucracy. A civilian bureaucracy is totally different from a mil military bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Because in, in a um, civilian bureaucracy, if you screw up, it's your job at stake. Theoretically, although they, it's hard to get rid of somebody that works right. for the federal government. In, in the military, if you make a mistake, people die. So there's a lot more emphasis on efficiency and thinking about the mission instead of your job and covering your ass and getting your bonus, like it is in the VA. Um, so it's a completely different mindset, and yet they think they're paramilitary. They think they have a military structure. But they don't understand the first thing about communications, and that is the central problem in the VA and all of the government bureaucracies. But when it comes to veterans, it's unconscionable. But they just they cannot figure out how to fix it because they don't listen to people like me who work in the field and know how what the problems are. I mean, I, would, I had to work really hard to establish contacts in central office. There's so many layers of bureaucracy. Right. But even when I got in touch with the director of mental health services at central office, he told me he has six layers between him and Shinseki. He never talks to him. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, bureaucracy always does. <coughs> and, and sometimes, too, I mean, you, if you give autonomy to uh, these organizations so that they can make those changes, mm -hmm. uh, a lot more can get done. Uh, but the, again, things don't get done if there's no money. And the, the, right. all the thing is, is I mean, many of the people that I've met at the VA really want to work and help these veterans. I mean, mm -hmm. there have been some terrific people that I've been through and, and have helped me. Uh, but at the same time, they're limited by the amount of money that's available to them and about how many people are available to them to handle these cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, and I mean, there were reports in which uh, come from the top down, you know, uh, you, know you can't handle all these cases, uh, you're going to have to uh, uh, get rid of some of these cases, and so they would not uh, recognize them for post-traumatic stress or whatever it might be. It is happening more and more, I'm seeing, yeah. Um, it's, it's shocking to me that anybody has the power to put pressure on regional offices to start screwing with these claims, but I'm hearing more and more stories. Our regional right. office used to be one of the best. Yeah. They turned around these claims fairly rapidly. They had a high, they had a high rate of resolving on the first go through, um, and they were pretty accurate in how they did them. But I've seen a, a dramatic change in the last year or so, and I think it's because of all these competing pressures. And the issue is not money. Right. There is enough money, but they're misallocating it. They have too many dedicated funds, and the worst problem is the VA wants to prove that it's the best health care system around. So they, they spend a huge and astronomical amount of money on generating reports instead of services. And we've actually, in, in the Roseburg system where I worked, we've lost a number of frontline positions um, because we were so top-heavy that they put a limit on hiring. Now there's a budget constriction, but the problem is that we have all those people not working. They're, they're, they're proving that we have right. a great product, but we don't have the people to provide it. Right. <laughs> Well, and, and too, that uh, they were saying in uh, some of the statistics that I was looking at that um, in the major cities, uh, the veterans were getting better care than people who were living in the rural areas. Uh, they were having a hard time. Plus, you know, for a lot of them, they have to travel a great distance to get to uh, a care facility that mm -hmm. uh, the VA uh, provides. I will say that that's getting better, though. The, um, Mark Ward is here in Portland. Mm -hmm is working on a national level to improve rural services, and, and they've got a bunch of good projects going on. That's good. Well, Portland's supposed to be at one of the tops. Uh, it is. Doing some but, so work. the problem with providing care in a rural setting like I worked in is that um, 
A, it's really hard to get people to work in the rural settings. B, there are large distances involved. And C, you can't build a hospital in every little town. Right. Um, so what they're doing now is they're um, turning some of these services over to uh, their contracting, which is great because veterans who need specialty services in southern Oregon have to travel up to um, 400 miles up to Portland to get things like orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, neurology, um, cardiology, all those, none of those services are available in, in southern Oregon. So um, that is atrocious. Uh, so, but there's a lot of veterans that are concerned that we're privatizing because they don't think right. they'll get as good a care, but then the ones that can't access it, they're, they're uh, you know, they really need it. I mean, th imagine if you're living with chronic pain from shrapnel wounds to your back mm -hmm. in your spine, and you have to travel four hours each way to go see a, a doctor or a physical therapist. It's crazy. We, but the problem is we can't afford it. Now, that is a budget issue. Yeah. We can't afford to contract all this out. Therapy, yes. I mean, because that's comparable to what they pay, uh, or even cheaper than what they pay us who work for the VA. But as far as um, these other services, our privatized system of healthcare is so freaking ridiculously expensive. Well, that raises expensive. another issue, doesn't it? Then the, that's the, I mean, one of the things is, is that if we had a single payer system, right. uh, it wouldn't matter if I went to the VA, I exactly. went to my, my own doctor, and I could go wherever I needed to go. Right. And that would open the door to, to everybody. Uh, and everybody has some skin in the game. You That's know? right. And there's here's another yeah. statistic for you. In 2004, they did a study, found out 1.8 million veterans do not have access to health care at all, mm -hmm. and 3.8 million other family members. Now, keep in mind, that was 2004. Right. So imagine how bad it is yes, now in this economy. Now, those people are almost all working Americans. So it's working Americans that make too much to get Medicare or Medicaid and too little to afford private insurance. And this uh, so-called Affordable well, Health Care Act didn't do squat for that. In um, fact, it's going to uh, uh, force people to, to purchase uh, uh, private insurance uh, that may actually uh, make it even more difficult for people. It's actually cheaper to not buy it and pay the penalty. Way, yeah. way cheaper. And right? a lot of people are going to opt out. Yeah, I wrote an wrote a editorial about this. It's in the appendix of the book. Uh, it's a, an analysis of, the, or a critique of the CBO analysis. It's completely phony. Um, when the CBO does an analysis, they have to go by the assumptions the politicians give them. And they never get the straight dope, and they know it. But they're forced to use those assumptions. And in this particular case, the CBO, uh, somebody who worked for the CBO at the time has since left, and now he's kind of a whistleblower, um, he said, you know, these, this is nothing but a wild guess in the first place. And then the official report says it'll only control the cost curve by, uh, I don't want to say the figure because I don't remember, but it's like, it's less than 5%. It's mm -hmm. going to bend the cost curve down less than 5%. That's not good enough. We're paying 17, 18% of our GDP for healthcare costs. 60% of that comes from the, um, our tax money, the other 40% from the consumer, and we leave 50 million out. It's insane. And, because there's no cost controls and because they got to keep their market share up, as it gets more expensive, they can't sell the product. If they can't sell the product, they raise the price more. Mm -hmm. So in a very short time, this exponential process would continue to the point where they, the whole system would break down. That's why the insurance industry went to Congress with their hat in their hands asking for a bailout. That's what this is. It's a bailout. The mandatory plan added 30 million customers, supposedly, and um, it's going to be subsidized by taxpayers sure. to support a private industry that is the problem. They are the entire problem. The, between the insurance agencies, the pharm pharmacy uh, industry, pharmaceutical. pharmaceutical industry that has a, got a ban, they bought senators and got a ban on uh, negotiating drug prices for Medicare, the medical equipment manufacturers and the corporate health care providers like President Frist. Oh, that's right, he didn't get elected. He quit because he made more money in the private sector. And he came from a family that owned a giant healthcare corporation. Uh, it's a mess. It's, it's <laughs> that's a mess. why corporate personhood needs to be abolished. Yes, it does. <laughs> and and that, that that's you know I mean I remember uh, back in the 70s you know when uh, um, 
I was an injured worker, you know, mm -hmm. and and uh, actually went down and lobbied as an individual for uh, uh, Injured Workers Day and was working with uh, the AFL-CIO and others. I was in a printing union and there were a number of people that came around this issue and uh, the CWA, uh, the communications workers was in the forefront of a lot of this. And there were people that were doing some terrific work. But we had, is the sad thing is, is you know, you had uh, Stan Long who was going around and, and attacking these uh, insurance companies and uh, regulators, you know, because mm -hmm. you had state insurance regulators that would not allow insurance companies to uh, uh, um, uh, deny you because of a pre-existing disease. They had all kinds of regulations, so these regulations actually benefited. Um, the, these companies were still making money. No, no. They were still making profit, and yet you had uh, uh, some fairly decent care under the so-called uh, capitalist system, uh, the market system that they had. They had a large risk pool at the time. That's right. Yes, they had they had a large risk pool, and the and I wasn't even paying any copay at that time. We had a good strong union, nice. you know. I had a thirty-five hour week, uh, and just I mean, it seems like I always came into something as it was disappearing, and it, it right. began to disappear year after year after. You can tell I was without insurance myself, you know. Well, the Teamsters in work. Portland, and I don't mm -hmm. know if this is nationwide or not, but they have, they self-insure. Yeah. And this is one of the problems <clears throat> because they are exempt under the ERISA law from a universal health care system. Um, Unions also need to look beyond their own immediate interests. I agree, totally. And there, most unions in Oregon did back mm -hmm. a single-payer system. Yeah. The major exception mm -hmm. was SEIU, at least on a national level. There, a lot of locals did support it. But the national leadership is not listening to the locals. That's right. If they, I mean, that's why, that's one reason Trump is in, because he's <clears throat> advocated single-payer, and the past president didn't. Right. Um, Leo Gerard advocates single-payer, but the president of SEIU, whose name escapes me, was pimping for the well, public option that plan. was Andy Stern, who uh, is no longer there, which is... Right, that's And why. things are changing. Oh, oh, is that right? Oh, yeah, things are changing. That I didn't know. Which is uh, good. I mean, there's some positive things. I mean, they still have a lot of the old guard. And, I mean, um, people who... I'm a, I'm a very strong supporter of unions um, uh, and labor rights. Uh, these are things, uh, issues that people should be actually very m much more aware of. They should know that history. Mm -hmm. But it has always been that uh, when you have a sort of a, I call them uh, uh, corporate unions, when, when you hire people to do your work, you lose your sort of uh, autonomy, you lose your democracy, and you have people in there that often are sitting at the same tables with the bosses, and they become friends, they go out and have drinks. Exactly, and, that's and, what it's all about. And, Same with the <clears throat> left-wing media. Yeah, and they, don't, and they don't know, you know, I mean, I, they get insulated, mm -hmm. and they begin, listening to this stuff and somehow uh, it makes sense when you're listening to it at one level but when you're uh, a mother uh, with a sick child and your husband's been injured on the job none of it makes sense you right. know yeah. these are these are things that the you have to constantly maintain your union democracy mm -hmm. and union I, I remember as a union member actually I would go into uh, uh, I, w I would go to my union meetings right. I'd be active within that union and mm -hmm. I would speak out and uh, uh, and I spoke out as a veteran and in a lot of ways I wouldn't say I was a veteran but you know we were in Central America at the time and I uh, uh, would s call on the union to support uh, union members that were being arrested in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Guatemala mm -hmm. because they were being jailed and killed by death squads. Wow. And we would raise money from my local union, would raise money and send it down there. Uh, we organized unions around. But this was because we could speak from the floor and we had our autonomy wow. and that we maintained that democracy. But a lot of times people would not come to those meetings until it was contract time. Right, you know? exactly. And if you don't have an interest in what's going on in the world and you only want to play the game of I, I make so much money and now I can go buy a exactly. boat and I can go out yeah. here and have a second home on the coast and that's disappearing folks. I'm sorry it's it's not there for a lot of people well, anymore. Well you know unions came down from a peak of what was it 28 percent in the 50s yeah. down to a 7 percent now. Yeah. They're losing their power and yet these uh, the old guard that's still there, they're not all old guard, no. thank God, but the old guard that's still there, you know, they just don't get it. 
um, they have to give up too. And some of the things they have to give up, uh, in order to fight the perception right. that they're so powerful that they can buy politicians, the politicians don't do anything for them. No. But there is this perception out there fostered by the corporate media. The best thing that they could do is get behind a constitutional amendment to abolish corporate personhood, but include unions. Yes. Because the right wing, and I'm talking even reasonable people that consider themselves conservatives, have this delusion that unions can buy too. Now, there's $100 of <clears throat> corporate money for every dollar a union can give, and that was before Citizens United. Right. <clears throat> so if the unions give up that power, then the bosses are not necessarily going to be friends with the people in office right away, but when we get rid of the corporate tools, they sure will be That's friends. Right. <laughs> well, I, uh, like I say, I, uh, there, I'm learning more and more uh, uh, union uh, rank and file are coming to these conclusions. I mean, they have no choice. Right. Uh, the economy is, is, uh, is waking people up. Wisconsin is a major example. Uh, Michigan, it's, it's, Indiana. Indiana. All of these, yeah. all these, these these states in which these governors have been put in power and are literally uh, making the, the sort of Mussolini fascist move, firing, exactly. the, firing exactly. the, uh, the city councils and, and putting in corporate uh, uh, heads to run municipalities. Isn't it wonderful? Uh, no, this is unbelievable. It, it is wonderful because this is why, because the fascist overreach is what's going to be their downfall. Um, you know, Stalin said, uh, if a capitalist is someone who will sell you the rope to hang them with. Yeah. These guys are so far overreaching that, that we're going to have the Tea Party join us eventually, I predict. Yeah. Um, they're angry, but they don't know that, that it isn't socialism as the pro problem, it's fascism. Right. So when they wake up to that fact, we'll all be on the same side. And these politicians are going to be out on their ass, and their corporate puppet masters are going to be having to look for a new market, because we are not going to let them ship our jobs over to other countries and make fortune from the American taxpayer from that, while the worker starves. It just ain't gonna happen. Well, too, you know, I mean, the, these wars, uh, the amount of money that's going into these wars and the debt that we're going into uh, for them is, you know, they, they talk about the American people being patriotic and coming around. We talked about patriotism being one of the key factors of fascism mm -hmm. and, and uh, this na nationalism. Uh, that one of the things is, is that if these corporations are so patriotic, then why aren't they volunteering to pay off the debt? <laughs> you know, I mean, they uh, created it. They, yeah, they said you know tax should be voluntary, right? Right. You know, they right. should be volunteering to pay that all off. And for, they're you know? not patriotic. <laughs> International corporations have no loyalty yeah. to any nation. They don't. Mm. The CEOs didn't even have loyalty to their stockholders. Right. As long as they can manipulate the stock price mm. and get these giant bonuses, then a lot of which is paid in stock. Um, holdings, what they do is they manipulate the price by filing false reports and using all kinds of tricks, and then they sell their own stock and tank the, the value of it mm -hmm. <laughs> and get away with it, and the stockholders left holding the bag. So tell me how that benefits this poor little old lady that's invested in the stock market they always talk about when you talk about regulating corporations. Right. They're screwing us every way they can, and Goldman Sachs is the worst. Right. They finance the wars and they get a cut from every piece of the war machine. Well, that's uh, one of the things that, that has bothered me. And when we talk about this, you know, we're talking about workers. Workers are veterans. Mm -hmm. Workers' families have, there's somebody in their family that served in a war, been injured in a war, died in a war. Uh, somebody somewhere, they know this. And all of us, you, generally, uh, it is the working class that is forced into uh, uh, service in one form, either through the economy or the draft or mm -hmm. some form or another to, to fight these wars. It was interesting when I'm reading in this book, um, uh, To End All Wars, talking about World War I, I mean, one of the, um, uh, the comments was, uh, one that I've heard over and over again, is why are working people going to fight for the, the ruling elites of these countries uh, to, to die why did and poor, kill, kill other workers in another country. Why you know? did poor farm boys fight for slaveholders in the South? That's Jingoism. Yeah. And, and being so uneducated that they believed the lies, that yeah. it was about state rights. I want to I remind people here, too, that uh, 
Memorial Day is on Monday, and uh, the VFP Chapter 72 is going to have a gathering at 1130 and a ceremony at 12 noon uh, at the Memorial Coliseum uh, Korean uh, War Wall. And uh, it's a great opportunity for you to come out there. Uh, there'll be a, a small ceremony, and then we'll march over to the Peace Park uh, that is up on the screen right now. Uh, this Peace Park is uh, being <clears throat> taken care of by Veterans for Peace. It's an incredible uh, symbol uh, throughout the nation for people to come to. Also to remind people that we will have a, Veterans, a National Veterans for Peace conference in Portland at Portland State University August uh, 3rd to the 7th. Uh, it's a great opportunity. If you would like to attend, you go to our, our um, uh, websites and you'll have an opportunity to sign up for that. We'll have some public events, and of course, I'll announce that later the closer we get to that. I also uh, wanted to, you know, I, I posted something on Facebook I just wanted to read. It just, it was something, you know, we talk about post-traumatic stress. And um, I wrote this, I saw ghosts with guns charging our line. Tigers growl in the bamboo. A voice says, your brother is here. Monsoon winds sweep o the ocean over our heads. Glasses fog in the fog of war. Death taps my shoulder, shakes my sleep. My shoulder is frozen in pain. Pain, thank my stars, I'm still alive. It was only a dream. Well, not only a dream, but a dream of the past. And these are the dreams that I constantly get, you know. There's something that shakes me every time I hear about war, every time I have a memory. And with these events coming up, of course, the memory of my brother, my, my son, uh, and how that's affected my family. There's a hole in my heart from the loss of these people. And there's a hole in the heart of so many people. And, you know, as, as in our Veterans for Peace thing, you know, it said, Ulysses S. Grant said, and the, the 18th President of the United said, one thing I never want to see is a military parade. We want to go out there and remember that we're working for peace and that we don't want to see another man or soldier die in this country. And I want to say it's not just the fan soldiers, it's all, all of, of us. us. All of us because of what it does to the economy, because of what it does to the national soul. Mm -hmm. we are, we, none of us escaped the cost of war. Well, I want to thank you, Rick, for coming to the program. Thanks it's for having really me. It's really a Dan. pleasure to have you here. And uh, please stay tuned for our next uh, uh, program, which is always on the fourth Saturday of the month.